Hello and welcome to the video version of the Happier at Work podcast. I'm your host Eva O'Brien and my guest today is Robert Baker and we talk all things male allyship. So if you're looking to support more women at work, if you are a woman and you need to get support from more male allies, this is definitely the episode for you. If you enjoy the show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, which I think is somewhere around here. And let me know what you think in the comments below. Enjoy today's episode. Robert, you're so welcome to the Happier at Work podcast. I'm thrilled to have you as my guest today. Do you want to introduce yourself to listeners a little bit about your background and how you got into doing what you're doing today? Yeah, thanks, Aoife. It's lovely to be here with you uh, and uh, sharing this podcast with your listeners. Um, So uh, I worked for 40 years in the corporate consulting world, uh, which was a fantastic training uh, for everything that's kind of come after. But in 2020, I decided to leave the corporate world and set up my own business. Uh, And in the corporate world, I'd done quite a lot of work around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it was kind of a a natural thing to go into that field when I started my own business. Um, Now, the only problem was I was starting at just the time the pandemic was hitting. So it was a (laughs) bit of a slow... 2020, not an ideal time. A bit of a slow start, right? But then it's amazing the power of one's network. You know, like I started to get a lot of people you know, connecting with me and, and saying, hey, look, we need some help with this and we need some help with that. And, you know, before long, you know, I've become, you know, really busy now in the, in the area that I'm specializing in, uh, which is really helping companies become more diverse and inclusive, uh, build those cultures, build the leadership practices that support that, and particularly around getting male leaders engaged in this stuff, because I think it's really important. Uh, I mean, they're 80% of leaders globally, they're over 60% of line managers, so really getting them engaged in um, driving improvements uh, and being a great place to work for women is a is a kind of key thing. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how I got into this, I suppose. Um, but I've always been interested in gender equality. Uh, I was one of the first men on the board of Women's Network, uh, the only man on the board for a long while, and then became a co-president of Women's Network. So, um, but for me, what, what gender equality was about was the other side of it, not necessarily advancing women, which I did want to do, but also actually liberating us men Mm -hmm. from all the stereotypes that we face. You know, the alpha male thing about, you know, be strong, be tough, be competitive, be demanding, don't cry, all of those things. You know, don't be emotional, don't show your emotional intent, don't show empathy, don't show vulnerability. That's a man box, basically, which I wanted to break out of. And so for me, doing this work in gender equality has been a, a brilliant way to break out of that man box. So I've been able to be true to myself, in a sense, because I realized I wasn't you know, like many other men in that sense, you know, Um, and uh, it's enabled me to really learn how to become a better leader, um, you know, and a a better colleague. Mm. uh, uh, And and so that's kind of really a big part of what's driven me to get where I am today. Brilliant. Love that. I love that as as an introduction. I think maybe we'll come back to the stereotypes associated with men in a second. But before we started recording, you mentioned about a recent poll from Ipsos. Do you want to share a little bit about that and um, the results from that? Yes, um, uh, th- thank you. And I mean, it, it really was quite alarming, I think, for many of us that that, that follow uh, the various sort of surveys and polls around um, attitudes of, well, particularly men and women uh, over time. Uh, this particular poll was showing the resistance that men are now giving to uh, the idea that gender equality you know, um, it, it is a good thing and it's still got further to go. What it showed was over 50% of men actually globally think gender equality has now gone too far. And this is at a time when we all know that there still aren't enough women in leadership. There still aren't enough women in organisations. Uh, they're not getting to the top quickly enough. You know, uh, companies are failing to meet their targets on gender equality. So in five years time, by 2030, a lot of companies are not going to make it if they're carrying on at the current rate. And if they're doing that in an environment where the men in the organization who are so powerful are pushing back, we've really got a problem. Mm. So this poll was a real wake up call to all of us to basically say, listen, we've got to do more work on convincing men that progress for women does not mean backward steps for men. It's not a zero sum game. It's good for it's good for all of us, basically. It's good for organizations. It's good for all genders. Um, But that message still seems we're having trouble getting that message across, it seems. And we've got to do a lot more work on that together. And why do you think that is? Like, do men feel threatened? And and I suppose I would love to come back to this point now about liberating men from these stereotypes, as you so, as you so, you put it so well. I think when you when you explained like, how do we get 
men away from these typical stereotypes that they have associated with, you know, always being strong and you're not allowed to show any emotion at work and all of these kinds of things that are associated. And at the same time, creating that really positive environment where women can thrive, where for a long yeah. time that hasn't necessarily been the case. So I suppose, first of all, why do you think there is this pushback and and me, you know, my background is in data and analytics. So I'm kind of thinking, how do you break that down? And is it at different levels? Is it is it slightly different or different types of industries? Is it slightly different? I don't know. Do you have the answers to that? But maybe we can speculate on, on why that might be. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, like in all these things, we've got to be a bit careful about generalizations because yes. there's always exceptions, you know, and, <laughs> and different sectors, you said, are different, you know, and men are different, too. And yeah. as are women, you know, like we come across all intersections, we come across all uh, cultures and backgrounds, you know, so there's a uh, there's a real danger in being too, um, you know, kind of uh, glib and treating men as a homogeneous group and women as a homogeneous group, etc. Yes. But I think I think what we do know is that a lot of the issues are to do with how we're socialized right okay yeah. so men tend to be socialized to be you know these strong tough uh, characters that don't um you know that don't show emotions and it's very interesting i've worked across a number of different cultures uh, i ran last year for example an engaging men workshop uh, or series of workshops in italy and one of the things that came out was italian men very strongly socialized to be the breadwinner so mm -hmm. for example if they're in a relationship with another person who's got an equally important job uh, you know, how do they manage that? And if, uh, God forbid, they ever lost that job, you know, does that mean they lose their identity? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as men, for example. So I think what we've got to recognize is that this starts really right from childbirth, really, yeah. you know, how we socialize boys, how we socialize girls. Um, and and then I think what, what we need to recognize is the world of work over time has been basically built by men for men, you know, you know the yeah. The privilege that we have as men going into the workplace is huge. We don't even see that privilege because yes, yeah, yeah. you know we don't have to experience any of the things that women experience. Mm. And you know, one of the things I do in the work that uh, that I do is I spend a lot of time talking to women about well, what is your experience in the workplace? And when we run those surveys, for example, of women's experience, and we uh, we show up the things that women talk about, for example, uh, like lack of development opportunities, lack of flexibility and policies, uh, being mansplained, you know, like the, the, these man interruptions and microaggressions. Yeah. Uh, this fact that the culture tends to be always on and, you know, it's all the hours you put in and, you know, all the dedication you give to the company that really is what helps drive your advancement. Um, you know, so there's a whole range of things that, that women experience in the workplace that men don't experience or men come at it differently. Um, and I think what's really interesting now is that younger generations of men are coming into the workforce. Uh, I mean, I'm coaching some of these younger leaders and they actually want a different world too. They, they want a world where they can show up for their kids, mm -hmm. where they can, you know, they often have a partner who's working in just as important a career as they've got. Um, and, and so I think, you know, we are starting to see a need and a demand from younger generations of men coming into the workforce for a different deal to the one that people of my generation uh, were, were looking for. Um, and I think companies have still got to process that. I think we've still got too many people at the top of companies that still believe in the old model of, you know, yeah. give everything to the company at all costs. And I think that's why women are leaving organizations mm -hmm. because they don't want that model. And I think what we're seeing now is a group of younger men coming through who don't want that model either. Yeah. So it's a really interesting question of where are the leaders of the future going to come from if we're still expecting leaders to work all the hours that God gave, have no family life, yes. yeah, travel yeah. everywhere, you know, that kind of model. Yeah. Um, so, so I think I think sort of these are really some of the factors that are, are coming in here. Um, and and so, how do we get a how do we get to a place where men end up pushing back? It's because we've got a situation now where men are in the majority, and the culture in many workplaces is based around that majority culture. Okay, yeah. uh, you might call it a dominant culture. Um, and like a lot of people, we don't like change. When we, you know, we managed to accumulate a nice position because women have been shut sidelined in various different ways, for example, after childbirth or or just because they don't have the same kind of profile that men have in terms of demanding, uh, you know, salary rises, advancement, et cetera. You can see the reasons why women kind of fall behind in the workplace uh, through no fault of their own, but more because of the system. And, and so what we realize is the system that we've had in the workplace has benefited men, which is why we've got 80% of leaders as men, for example, and 60% of line managers, now what we're talking about is leveling the playing field. Companies mm -hmm. want to have a more equal balance of genders in leadership. 
So one of the things I'm talking to men about is, listen, you still have a role in leadership in the future, even if you're starting to say, oh my God, all these targets for women mean no more promotions for men. That isn't true. Mm. Companies still want a big chunk of their leaders in the future to be men. It's just these have to be men that know how to do the diversity and inclusion part, know how to partner and work alongside women. Yeah. Um, and if you can learn those skills, which are often emotionally intelligence based uh, and they're learnable, then you can be that kind of leader of the future. Um, so part of the work that I do is basically equipping leaders today for the leadership that they need to have in the future uh, around this more inclusive, more uh, allyship, uh, more basically emotional intelligence based approach to leadership. And that, I think, is the environment we're going to look for in the future. All the surveys of what people at work want, they want leaders that are like that, basically. And the pandemic yeah. obviously reinforced that. So here's the here's the world we're going into but we're still not well set up to do that. So the men are pushing back because they see this change happening. They see companies saying, listen, we now need targets because yeah. this isn't going to change unless we bring in targets. They're pushing back on those targets. So then companies are saying, hey, we've got to do something because we've got to bring these men on board. Uh, and of course, you know, this isn't a man bashing thing. This is actually saying, let's understand what's on men's minds and let's have a discussion around what's on their minds, but let's educate them hmm. about the... The, the situation that we've got now and yeah. the way that the world is changing and needs to change and help break down their fears about yeah. it because actually there's something good in this for them. And yes. that's the message that I bring. It's a message of hope to say there's something good in this for you guys to get with the gender equality, diversity and inclusion mm. um, uh, thrust that we're having these days. And um, in a survey that I did two years ago with Danielle Ethan Darker at Token Man Consulting, we surveyed 100 male leaders about the benefits that they got from being involved in diversity and inclusion and allyship work. And 97% of those 100 male leaders said that they felt they were now better leaders and better human beings mm. as a result of doing that yeah. work. Yeah. So sorry, it's a very long answer to your question, <laughs> but hopefully it shows the, well, yeah, no, <laughs> the challenges we're facing. Exactly. Um, one of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times now is this idea of targets. And I'd love to get your views on that. Like to me, mm. targets, quotas, where have you seen it done? Does it actually work? Do we need to have targets in place in order to meet them? Or will things naturally evolve without having those targets? Like any thoughts around having those definite targets in place and, and the benefits of that? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So firstly, I should declare I'm on the board of European Women on Boards, right? And European Women on Boards supports the uh, the EU um, regulations around having uh, at least 40% of the gender on boards, basically. Mm. So okay. we're pushing for for that. What we see is individual countries setting up quotas. I mean, Norway did that some time ago. France has been very uh, uh, sort of in the forefront of this too. I think quotas are good because basically they set the tone for the fact that we want to see more women in board and leadership positions. And often change can be quite slow in some order, in some countries if you don't have those kind of quotas. Now, the UK has been a little bit of an exception because we've achieved some progress without actually having, you know, legal quotas, as mm -hmm. it were. We've done it by, you know, persuade um, and, you know, comply or explain kind of thing. Um, so what we, we we see is there is some progress in the UK, but in many countries, the progress is still way too slow. So the quotas at a country level really focus the mind on you want to get more women into boards and into leadership positions. For individual companies, it's about targets, it's about having a business target okay. to say, if we want to get more women into leadership, uh, and a lot of the companies I'm talking to all want to achieve that because they're way behind where they want to be right now, we have to set a target for it. Just like we set a target for any other business initiative that we're doing, okay? We're going to set a target and then we're going to ask our leaders and managers to help implement that target. And in some companies, they're even tying now performance goals and bonuses to the achievement of that target, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so leaders will lose bonus if they don't achieve, for example, the recruitment targets for women in the organization. So um, I think they're absolutely necessary and, and they're a part of doing good business. Targets, are, you know, you will um, help your organization succeed if you've got those targets. But of course, you then need to have a process for achieving that target. You yes. need to be realistic about what it's gonna to take to achieve that target. I personally think a lot of companies have set a target and then hoped, basically. And as we know, hope <laughs> is not a strategy. strategy is hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And 
you know, uh, and, and so basically what we found is they haven't made progress, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and they're fighting this headwind now of the resistance from men. Uh, and yet they're still trying to achieve a target for women in leadership. So it's a real challenge now coming through. And I yeah. think in the next couple of years, we're going to see this come to a head. Some companies are going to have to either pull back their targets because they're not achieving them, or they're going to have to come up with a very good explanation as to why they're not making yeah. those happen. Um, yeah. The good news is, if you're determined about it, I work with a number of great companies that are making progress. And the way that they're making progress is they're spending a significant amount of money, like any other change initiative in the company. They're making it very clear there's targets for it. They're tying executive performance goals and bonuses to it. And and they're making it clear it's it's driven from the top. And if you yeah. do those kind of things, um, it's a big change. It's a big culture change. It's a big change in the way you do things. But actually, uh, it's a change that's good for your business overall. And uh, basically, you know, you just have to kind of, you know, uh, be determined about it and and basically do what you say uh, rather, uh, you know, and so so take actions that basically achieve all of this and be very determined about it and, and very, um, you know, uh, sure that you're going to make sure that everyone's following through in the organization on it. And then if you, you know, highlight successes, you say, hey, look, here's an area where it's really working well, that encourages other parts of the company to follow suit you know so yeah. there's a lot of good tools and tips and techniques for how companies can achieve this yeah. so um but i think the biggest reason why companies aren't achieving it today is because they're treating it as a one-off exercise they're running a workshop and saying oh that will solve all the problems running a single workshop obviously won't you need actually a proper change management program to change the culture towards more a one of gender balance and inclusion and you need to change the leadership skill sets that you require you need to change the mindsets and you need the leaders at the very top to support it. And so they're very significant things you need to do. But if you do those things and you take this seriously, you will make progress. And maybe we can bring it back to, well, what are the benefits? Like, so so what? Why do we need more women in leadership positions? Wow. <laughs> yeah, how long have you got? Um, so <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, firstly, like it's, always been to me a great regret that the incredibly capable women that for example i was at university with you know surrounded by brilliant women right okay uh, at least half the students at my university were, were brilliant women right who mm. who then maybe didn't make as far as they could have got in the, in the corporate world and you realize that companies are missing out on that talent so yeah. so one of the biggest reasons for having more women in uh, the company and more women in leadership is they come at this very differently to, uh, for example, men, right? Okay, they often have a different focus on risk. They have a different um, focus on opportunities. They have a different leadership style. Uh, they have a different way of collaborating with others. Uh, all of the organizations that I know that are bringing women into leadership positions and really pushing them through are saying, wow, this is fantastic. Why didn't we not do this before? Yeah. Because we're actually improving the overall performance of the organization. Mm. And companies like McKinsey have done these studies that show that you know, gender balance is correlated with better performance. And, you know, yes. I, I, and I'm very close to this and I can see why, because these women are brilliant and they are really helping to uh, create more balance. You know, we see so many organizations where, you know, they are run by a group of, you know, let's be honest, white men who all think the same way, probably all went to the same kind of universities. Yeah. And, and so surprise, surprise, sometimes they completely screw up because they're all just following each other and there's no mm. new ideas. So uh, this is about getting fresh talent in, getting innovation, getting new ideas. And then, of course, you've got to look at the other areas. Their customers probably would be very happy to see more balance uh, yeah. at the top of organizations. I mean, I'm working with a fashion company at the moment, which is very male dominated, despite the fact that a lot of the customers are women. You know, yeah. is that is that a good thing to have? You know, um, and, and so there's a lot of other reasons around this, around corporate brand, uh, and then in some sectors now, because we talked about the difference in sectors, the regulators are getting involved. So, for example, in financial services, the regulators saying we must have more diverse cultures in organizations um, and, and the regulators in other sectors, too. Um, but I, I think this key thing really is if, if we want companies in the future to bring in these the best ideas to help uh, meet all the challenges that we're facing around sustainability, around uh, you know equity and, and, and around better economic growth and better performance, we need all the talent, not just a subset of the talent which happens to be male. We need everybody, and so we need these brilliant women to be coming in and and doing their um, you know and doing their part to help organisations move forward. And of course, as you know, 
um, women is one element of a more diverse and inclusive environment mm -hmm. you also want to be thinking okay what other areas are there where we're underrepresented you yes. know so often it might be people from ethnic different ethnic backgrounds it might be people with disabilities mm -hmm. uh, it might be you know people uh with gay sexual orientation or whatever um if we're not making the workplace available to them and if we're not making leadership available to them we are really missing out big time on the fantastic skills that they bring one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with was a trans uh, woman, basically. And had we not had a trans woman in the organization, we would have lost out a fantastic amount of skill that that person was bringing. So that's why we need everybody. Yeah. And that's why we need more women in leadership. Brilliant. Now, really, I think a really great way to do a synopsis of all the reasons. Of course, I totally agree with you, but it's more to get it out on the table. Let's have a talk yeah. about these things. And um, one of the things we kind of skirted around it earlier, but it's this idea of the amount of work that people have going on. So one of the challenges mm. I see often with clients, with friends is they're looking, these women are looking at their managers and they see just mm. how much work their manager has going on and they think, I don't want that for myself. I mm -hmm. want to have better balance. I don't want to take on that level of responsibility. I don't want to work the extra hours, do the travel, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on, on, you know, is, is that kind of tying in with this idea of culture change where we need to focus much more on the outcomes and less on the time invested? And going back to your earlier point that we, we talk about, um, you know, oh, I'm here and I'm working all the hours, but yeah, what do you have to show for it? What are the results that you're getting yeah. that the company is looking for? And more hours doesn't necessarily always mean better results as well. And, and that mindset shift. So any thoughts around solving that problem? Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we've seen, obviously, in some countries, like in Sweden, for example, I think now there's much more focus on having that balance because what they mm. found is you can work less hours and be more productive. Yes. Like a lot of us are showing up for lots of hours at work without actually necessarily being being productive. Mm. So just being in the office, God forbid, for many, many hours is not necessarily the way to achieve uh, success. I think we need to be bolder yeah. about how we define leadership roles, how we define roles at the top. I was chatting to someone the other day who said, why aren't more leaders job sharing, for example? Can't we do yes. these leadership roles uh, in, you know, with a job share so that we've actually got two people fulfilling the role we'd actually have two minds uh, basically on the, on it and, and surely it wouldn't that actually be better than one so I think we've just been very unimaginative about how roles at the top can be done because I think they can be broken down in ways that it would mean that people uh, that haven't normally wanted to aspire to those roles could actually then see themselves in one of those roles so I think you know job sharing um and is, is, an, is a critical one. And I think we should look at more of that or leaders as part-time workers or, or leaders that, you know, it's really interesting. I think there's still this incredible, um, you know, what's the word, uh, slight on people that work part-time. Yeah. You know, I mean, part-time work is basically you're saying, look, I'm going to take 80% of my hours for 80% of the salary or whatever it is, but I'm still going to give you 100%, you know. Exactly. Uh, but in some yes. organizations, they yeah. think that somehow if you're working anything other than 100% of the hours, you're somehow slacking and you're not yeah. doing your your bit. Mm. We've got to completely change the mindset on that. And yeah. I think we've I think collectively we've all been pretty unimaginative about that. Now what I'm seeing is if we want to retain women in the in the workforce and we want to retain these younger generations coming through, we have got to be more flexible. We've got to be more imaginative about a variety of different things. One is about like how jobs get done. Can they be shared, for example? Where can they be done? Can they be done flexibly? You know, can they be done remotely? Can, they, can we have a hybrid situation? Because that, you know, there's a big hoo-ha at the moment about, you know, return to the office kind of thing. Uh, yeah. and a big push to go back to the office. Whereas a lot of women are saying, we don't want that. And a lot of younger people are saying, we don't want that either. So um, we got to think much more imaginatively now about how we offer work to people uh, to make it something that they really want, you know, to make it an organization they really want to work for, where they want to really come and, and give it their best. And, you know, companies are missing out millions and millions of dollars and pounds and euros at the moment by having workforces that are not fully engaged, are not fully motivated. Um, and some of these things that we're talking about here could make a massive difference to employee motiv motiv motivation and engagement, which would result in enhancements in productivity. So um, why we're not having more of these discussions and why we're not changing things more 
I don't quite understand, except that I still see a degree of rigidity. You know, this is what we've always done and we're yeah. frightened to change in case it doesn't give us a better results. So so sometimes I think actually people at the top, it's a bit too risk averse to okay. really be. But we're, we're, we're going into a world where being risk averse could potentially hold you back because we're now in an era of, you know, AI, of course, as we all know, that's changing the workplace dramatically. Uh, we're in an era of new generations coming into the workforce. They want different things. So the whole world of work is changing. Um, and and some of the things that worked in the past are no longer going to, to work. And I was chatting into a, a law firm um, uh, a person the other day who was talking about the partnership structure they have in a law firm. And in a, to be a partner in a law firm, as far as I understand it, you've really got to put a lot of hours in. Yeah. And a lot of people are saying they don't want to do that anymore. Mm. So where the law firms are going to get their partners from in the future, I'm not quite sure they could end up with just a bunch of men who are prepared to put the hours in yeah. to get high salaries. But I think I think it's a real challenge. Some of these models now are really coming out of strain because they're that they they were fit for the past, yeah. but they're not necessarily fit for where we are now or for the future. Yeah. Well this the the specific example of law firms came up in my conversation about the four day week. Um, so I've had various different conversations about the four day week on the podcast and I will put a link to the previous episodes in the show notes for people to listen to. But that was one of the things. So law firms, accountancy firms, which are based on billable hours. And so they bill in increments of 15 minutes or whatever it might be so that they they can, um, you know, that they can bill the client the, the maximum amount. And so that was one of the challenges that I had about you know, and I've come from an agency background where it is, it's billable time, but it's kind of more in days rather than in 15 minute increments, yeah. basically. But, um, you know, their response to that was that, again, it's this shift in mindset towards outcomes. Mm. And so you can reduce your working hours in the law firm if you focus on producing outcomes for clients. So it's not about the input, which is the mm -hmm. amount of time that you spend on something, but this mindset shift to what outcomes are we creating for our clients and how valuable are those outcomes to those clients and therefore how much can we charge them? And so it, they get charged on a project basis rather than by the number of hours that they deliver to a specific client, which I think is, yeah. is interesting and definitely could apply to any sort of agency type of model or law firms, accountancy firms, anything that has billable hours as well. So I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I think there's gonna be more thought given there. I know, for example, when I was working in the consulting world, which is also driven on hours, we had these discussions actually about, well, if we add up all the hours, we are actually still undercharging the client because we're giving them a huge amount of value from all yes. of the experience on top of that. I mean, obviously the experience should be reflecting the chargeable rate, yes. but you still find actually sometimes you're giving clients more value than actually strictly speaking you're charging for, for the hours done. So, um, you know, I think that it has to be rethought. I think this whole, whole thing about, you know, uh, what value you're providing, yes. what are clients prepared to pay for, mm. and then work out how you deliver that. Yeah. Um, and I think I think that that billable hour thing is a little bit of a, you know, it was great, as I said, for the last decades. But I think, you know, going forward, we probably need a different way of looking at it. Definitely. Definitely. I'd love to come back to this idea. So maybe picking apart this idea of being risk averse and the notion that as an organization, how do we make those changes? You mentioned about investing in women and you need to, mm -hmm. I was going to say throw money at the problem, but that's quite a that's quite a flippant comment but i mean you really need to invest properly and it's not a one-off workshop as you mentioned it's it's properly running a change management program mm -hmm. looking at the leadership skills that exist if companies are averse to making those kinds of changes what can we do to encourage them so if there's someone listening today who's maybe in a senior leadership position and they want to influence up the chain to make these kinds of changes in their own organizations what kind of advice do you have for them well i would say take a look at the people that are succeeding take a look at the yeah. companies that are succeeding and and see what they're doing and see how that could apply to you so i'm very fortunate to work with quite a, a sort of big range of global companies one of the companies i'm working with at the moment is a french global energy company called ng and and they are facing the fact that the world of energy is changing obviously we're moving to clean energy mm. um, from fossil fuels etc what they've realized is that they need a kind of different skill set for the future. They need a different way of leading the organization. Um, it's very interesting, actually, because they have a female CEO as well, Catherine McGregor, who's, um, you know, obviously very good at this. So um, what she's 
what the organization has said basically is you know we need to rethink uh how we go forward um that it's not going to be a replica of how we went in the past we know we, we need to do something different and what they realized they needed to do was get more women into leadership obviously because they were behind on that kind of uh, target or, or they set a target and they then needed to to move from where they were to get to that target and and so they've been very forward in uh, bringing women into their leadership programs to train up the women that they need for the future and they've been you know really supporting those women brilliantly and a lot of women now say that it's a great company to work for because they've got all these opportunities yeah but the really smart thing that they did was also to invest in the men so that the men realized actually there's something in, in it for them as well so what Eng is doing is investing in its men leaders to help them become the leaders of the future where they you know lead in a gender balanced environment where they lead in a new world where social and emotional skills are much more important. And so actually one of the best things that they're doing for their women in the organization is investing in their men so that they reduce that pushback so the men really understand why these changes are happening and very important what their role can be in it yeah. in the future. And then what they're doing also is they're bringing their men and their women uh, together mm. to talk about how they genuinely create a partnership going forward. Uh, so we get rid of the us and the them and it becomes a we. And I think, you know, that's the secret for me, the secret source of success is to bring people across genders together yeah. to understand what each other are experiencing. OK, so we need to listen to each other and what our challenges are, but then we need to resolve to work on those together and support each other to build a much you know, healthier and more productive organization. And so I would say if you look at a company like Engie and see what it's doing uh, and they just produce their results, by the way. And it's working because they're yeah. now getting more women into leadership, et cetera. Uh, so that's great. Um, and this is all available on their you know, website. You can see what they're doing. Um, you know, let's look at companies like that that are succeeding and saying, okay, could we apply some of these things that they're doing to what we're doing in our organization? Um, but, you know, what it will mean, it'll mean a culture shift. It'll mean a mindset shift. It'll mean a significant multi-year program with a significant investment. And I think what I'm saying to all the companies that I talk to is you need to be prepared to do that if you really want to see the change that's going to help you get into a better place. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a let's bring let's bring someone in for a workshop for an hour and then yeah. that, then we're going to hit our targets. Exactly. Let's bring in uh, a great discussion on International Women's Day and then, you know, uh, let's not Don't do it. Don't get me started on International yeah, yeah. Women's Day <laughs> <laughs> with the cupcakes and the purple and all sorts of stuff um robert i know we said we would talk about happiness at work in general and you had some really interesting insights to share in relation to that so i'd love to hear some of your insights around happiness at work in general and what that means to you yeah well I, i'm very fortunate i'm in a, a, you know for me a, a great situation where uh a obviously i'm very happy at work hopefully that comes across in the way that i talk about it and the things that i'm doing um, but but you know when I look at it, of course I'm I'm, at, I'm actually in an advantageous position because uh, I've got uh, a real combination of things that that, that that contribute to this. So I mean, firstly autonomy, right? I'm running my own business now, so I've got a huge amount of control over the projects I take on, the clients I work with, the people I work alongside. I mean, yes, of course I've got to keep my clients happy. So there's obviously a customer at the end of it who I've got to keep happy. But as long as I do that, I've got a huge amount of control over what I do. And, and that's a big difference to how it was in the corporate world. Nothing wrong with the corporate world. I love the corporate world. I was there for 40 years. But in the corporate world, you have less autonomy because obviously, yeah. you know. You don't you get to choose the... your clients. You just kind of like, here, you're working on well, this client. And you're working within corporate guidelines at various yes. different times, you know. Yeah. Um, so those can drive you nuts sometimes. But but they're there for good reasons. It's a big organization. In a smaller firm like I'm running, you know, uh, there, there's a lot more autonomy. That's great. The second thing, obviously, is meaningful work. I mean, I really have got work that uh, is meaningful to me, and it also aligns with my values. So in other words, I'm a strong believer and an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. The work that I'm doing is all around that, it's strongly aligned with that. And like I said, I'm advising companies on how to build cultures of inclusion, how to build leadership practices that support inclusion. I'm advising companies on engaging men as allies for inclusion. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm getting to do work that for me is very meaningful. And of course, I'm seeing an impact as well. You know, it's one of the things we sort of talked about was if we can see that an impact of what we're doing 
then I think it's great. And, you know, like one of the men that I'm coaching, for example, at the moment, has actively sponsored a woman in his team. And she's now got a promotion and an exciting new role as a result of that, you know. And that's like it showing up in practice, you know. So this guy came to our workshops, did the coaching, has now got a much better awareness of the need to sponsor women in the workplace because women typically have been over-mentored and under-sponsored, right? So he's doing something okay. to sponsor this woman. She's, he's taking a risk on her career, basically, and her. Uh, and, and, and so that's really great to see that. So there's that sort of impact uh, from, from that. And, and then, of course, there's the impact from the other stuff that I do, like being a trustee of European Women UK or being on the board of European Women on Boards. Uh, you know, in those roles, I'm very, very lucky because I get a chance to influence things that really matter to me. Uh, so, um, you know, so, so that that's important too. And then I think, obviously, uh, for me, building relationships with people is critical. So working alongside people that I enjoy working with, who I learn from, and okay, so I'm not in a company doing that, but what I've done is I've built up a, a, a selection of collaborators who are really brilliant people who I enjoy working with. So I'm working with a gender equality uh, outfit in Brussels called Jump, who are brilliant. I'm learning a lot working with them. In the UK, I'm working with a lovely lady called Joy Burnford for Compass Equality. She brings me in as her allyship specialist, but we spark off each other in terms yeah. of you know ideas, and and so that that's great. Um, and then when you add to that, you know, sort of some of the other things that I'm able to really grow personally and professionally from the work that I'm doing. I'm I'm working on demanding projects, which you know cause me to scratch my head a lot of the time. Um, but actually, by collaborating with others, you know, we come up with brilliant solutions. So I've just announced, for example, a new program for allyship called as Men as Allies Partnering for Inclusion with a lovely lady called Hira Ali, and we're coming at this from a cross-cultural and intersectional point of view, so really helping leaders be more uh, capable of uh, working across cultures and across intersections uh, as they become allies. Um, with another one of my clients, we're creating workshops on inclusion and unconscious bias, which uh, we're doing it in conjunction with their employee resource groups. So we're co-creating this whole program. It's so exciting to be doing something like so different like that. Mm. Uh, and of course, across Europe, I mean, I'm working with companies in a variety of different European countries, a little bit in the US too. So that kind of global dimension, I think, is is something that really brings richness to the work that I do. And, and you know, I said to someone the other day, I love travel too. Someone said to me, don't you find it stressful that I was in like uh, Berlin, then I was in Rotterdam, and then I was in Brussels, and then I was in Amsterdam. I'm still a kid, right? I like getting to Heathrow. I like getting on the plane. Or I like getting actually increasingly Same. on, yeah, on yeah. Eurostar these days. Yeah. I love getting on Eurostar, you know, and then getting my little laptop out and doing my work on the train. Um, but I still love that whole thing about travel. And then I think the other thing for me is I, I'm really lucky because I've got this curious mindset where I'm always trying to find, okay, other new ways of doing work. Uh, you know, like, for example, when I'm doing presentations, I'm now engaging people more with things like Mentimeter, for example, which is a great way of engaging people. And a lot of the work that I'm doing, I'm now using chat GPT. So, you know, like that is a really great way of, you know, getting some initial start of the 10 ideas about things, you know. Mm. Um, so I, I think the other thing, it allows me to give back. And I think this is really critical to me that, you know, I do earn, you know, good money from what I'm doing work-wise. But that also enables me to give back. So I do quite a bit of pro bono stuff, whether yeah. it's be on the board of various women's networks. But I also support women's causes. I've sponsored a book launch for a woman professor last year and a networking uh, lunch for a group of black rising professional women. I can do that because I'm earning the money in my business to be able to do that. And I think yeah. it's it's only right that I should do that because I'm giving back. It's important, back I think. Yeah. To, yeah. To, totally. Yeah. And then, you know, like I'm very lucky to be able to have that work life balance a little bit, although sometimes I worry about that. I'm supposed to be working four days a week, but, uh, uh, but the, uh, the it's the hard. Thing is, I think when you hard. love what you do, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. when it's so enjoyable, and there's always going to be more to be done. This is the thing I, I'm realizing it more and more running my own business that your work will never be finished. Yeah. And I think in corporate we see the end of a project and we think, well, that's that finished, but maybe we neglect to think, well, there's always going to be more to do. There's, there will always be more work waiting for you to pick up. So it's, it's knowing, I think, when to, when to say no, when to take those breaks so that you do feel recharged and refreshed and able to do the work and give it your all. Well, 2024 is meant to be the year for me where I put more self-care uh, first, as it were, uh, because like during the pandemic, I had a home office 
And then as soon as the pandemic was over, my wife kicked me out of the house and said, right, you've got to find your own office. So I'm now <laughs> working in my own office, uh, hot desking, as it were. But it's great. I have a 15 minute walk from home to the office. Oh, lovely. So yeah. it's brilliant. I've got, yeah. And I can grab a coffee on the way and I can yeah. drink my coffee while I'm booting up my computer. And, you know, I've got this nice little routine uh, when I'm doing that. Um, but what I still find is that office at home is dangerous because I come home in the evening and then somehow go up the stairs to where the office is and yeah. start working again. You yeah. know, and then... I'm putting too much time in. Uh, and as he said, partly that's because I'm enjoying it so much and, 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 and clients are demanding it. But also I think it's um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worry. I've got to make sure I keep that balanced out because there's things I haven't done that I want to do, like play more guitar, do more hiking, mm. you know, go to more art galleries, all those things. And I've got to realise actually, you know, there's a cost to what I'm yeah. doing, which is I'm not doing some of these other things that yes. I really could enjoy also enjoy yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. is there anything else that you think you'd like to get across that we haven't necessarily covered already yeah i think one of the other things really is about support at home i mean mm. really i'm so lucky because you know my wife and i came up to a kind of conclusion about how we we're going to do things i mean she's the yoga teacher um she's got a very different kind of work profile to me um and and so we decided that that, that she'd be very happy to provide you know support while I'm kind of putting so many hours into this as yeah. it were I mean I still have my chores at home to do I've still got to do my bit <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. Of, of that but but I think I think you know it would be very remiss of me to not reflect that and I think mm. you know for all of us we've got to work out what's that right balance between you know what we give at work and what, what we give at home yeah you know and, and so that's been important to navigate that in the right way with my wife Pamela and, and make sure that she's happy with the balance too um and, you know, I think that's a secret also for others these days that I'm hearing more and more about from younger generations of people coming into the workplace. They do want better balance and they also want, you know, rich experiences. They don't want a job that's, you know, kind of dull and doesn't grow from year to year. They want, yeah. you know, jobs that develop them. They want opportunities to do exciting things. I mean, for example, I was chatting some the other day. He said he's been working for three years and he wants to take his sabbatical. I go, wow, I worked for 40 years and I don't think I even got a sabbatical at any point. But it was kind of <laughs> like, you know, but it, it, they're looking at this whole thing in a different way. And my daughter, for example, is looking at that in a different way too. I mean, she's in her 30s and I learn from her all the time that, that younger people are looking at this in a very, very different way. So I think that's something that can help us, you know, dare I say older folk, learn a trick or two. So what I'm going to try and learn in 2024 is the trick of more self-care. Yeah. And uh, my, my wife's given me two vouchers for floats, uh, you know, where you go and completely zone out in a oh, pod. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. So I've been meaning forward. to try that for years, actually, and I still haven't. I've done it a couple of times and it's brilliant. You really yeah. sort of zone out. Uh, so I need to use those vouchers and book those in. Um, but, but other than that, I think really, um, like I said, I'm just so happy that I'm in a place where I've still got the health Mm. And I've still got the uh, opportunity to, you know, to have this impact and 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 to be doing the work that I'm doing. And it's enormously, um, you know, joyful to me that every now and again, that will also get recognised as well. So, I, and if you saw my post on the little award that I won uh, the other, you know, the other night uh, from Women in Management um, at the House of Lords, it was great. You know, it's like an Oscar, Amazing. this little statue. <laughs> and I had a picture of me taken with Lu Luquesa Barak, who's one of the BBC News presenters who's kind of presented the award. And it was like that moment where you think, oh, actually, it's really nice. You know, what I'm doing is also being recognised. And I think that's yeah. a kind of real joyful part of it, too. Brilliant. And if people want to reach out, if they want to connect with you, what's the best place or what's the best way they can do that? So, I mean, LinkedIn, I live on LinkedIn, basically, as <laughs> you will know me. So uh, uh, reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'd love to obviously pick up conversations, connect with people. Uh, I'm already doing a lot of that. It's been one of the rich things that I've done in the last few years is really reach out to a lot of very, very different people, people very different to me. Uh, and and so I've learned so much from people with different cultures, different mm. backgrounds, and, and and I'd love to do more of that. So, uh, so, so yeah, let's, um, let's connect on LinkedIn. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, sharing your, is your wisdom, sharing your insights around male allyship, how to support women at work. And then also, generally about being happier at work and i know before we started recording we were, we were sort of both saying that like i don't want to work in a in a job let's say where i i feel like i need to retire when i turn a certain age i want to continue having that impact and i think it's really important 
you know, for your health, for your mental well-being to if that's what you want to do, to continue doing that and and not have the attitude that I'm waiting for retirement before I can feel happy or before I can travel the world or whatever it is that you want to do, that we're deferring it in some way. I want to continue doing what I'm doing, but also have that sense of balance so that I can do the things in my spare time that I that I want to do that bring me joy outside of work as well. Well, that's great, Eva, because you're going to inspire a whole bunch of people to do more of that. So, um, uh, and if I can contribute that a bit with this podcast, uh, then uh, I'll be a bit del- delighted about that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. It's a pleasure.